Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Dieck, and I'm pleased to be able to speak to you this afternoon on the CLIA regulation and some recent and much needed activity on the rule that has come out of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. To give you a little bit of my background, I've spent my entire career in the laboratory starting about 30 years ago when I graduated with my degree in cytotechnology. After a few years, my interest grew in the field of histology, and I sat for the histology certification exam later, earning a leadership role in my facility, overseeing our anatomic pathology department. When our facility became part of a bigger system, I additionally took on a role that focused on the quality, regulatory, and compliance worlds for the general laboratory, and that is where I've spent the last 15 or so years. The agenda for the presentation this afternoon will include the following items in relation to some CLIA regulation fundamentals and the most recent updates. We will talk about the background of the CLIA rule to give everyone a starting point for this presentation. We'll discuss the CLIA rule at a high level, specifically talking about test complexity, certificate types, specific regulations as called out in the rule, personnel requirements and inspections, and accreditations. Finally, we will talk about the two most recent publications that have been published by CMS, announcing some finalized rule changes, as well as some proposed rule changes. So let's talk a bit about the background of the CLIA rule. The CLIA rule governs laboratory operations and compliance, so it seems very appropriate to start with explaining the history behind this regulation. CLIA, which was enacted on October 31, 1988, is a federal mandate that defines laboratory testing standards. CLIA stands for CLIA Laboratory Improvement Amendments, and the rule that was published in 1988 supersedes the requirements that were originally outlined in the CLIA Act of 1967. On February 28, 1992, regulations surrounding proficiency testing, or PT, were added to the rule. This rule regulates all laboratory testing used for diagnosis, monitoring, or treatment, and it sets particular quality standards for all laboratory testing in relation to accuracy, reliability, and timeliness of patient test results. The rule is considered test site neutral, which means that the same regulations apply regardless of the location of the testing. This is important because of the nature of laboratory testing in the healthcare setting, meaning it can be mobile, if you will. So for example, when testing is performed at your church or in a grocery store, et cetera, the regulations are the same and are dependent on the kind of testing you are doing. There are two agencies that carry out the CLIA federal regulations, CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration. We will talk more about each of these items on the following slide, but CMS, with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, were originally charged with developing and implementing the CLIA regulations. Specifically, they are responsible for the items that are listed on this slide. The FDA, on the other hand, is specifically responsible for categorizing test methods for complexity, which drives which pieces of the CLIA rule we have to follow for each type of testing. You've been hearing much about this in the news as COVID testing was developed at the start of the pandemic. The FDA was involved then to provide EUAs or emergency use authorizations for the testing and is now circling back around to provide a more official stance on this testing in terms of complexity. For the next few slides, we're gonna talk about the CLIA regulation itself and its components at a very high level. This is just to give you a flavor of the contents of the rule in case you have not read the rule in its entirety. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the type or complexity of testing. This is a good starting point because this particular piece of information on every test drives what parts of the CLIA regulation we have to follow for that test system. CLIA specifies that laboratory requirements are to be based on complexity of the test method performed. There are three different complexities of testing, waived, moderate, and high. Relating back to the COVID testing when it first came out, COVID testing was not defined via a complexity because it was an EUA, but the EUA determined which environments the testing could be performed. In most cases, and particularly with PCR testing, it was determined that it must be done in a high complexity lab. In other cases, it was approved to be done at the bedside and in a wave testing environment. It is these depictions that drove how we implemented the testing and what became part of the process as we initiated patient testing. 
we will discuss wave testing first. The CLIO rule established provisions for categorizing a test as waived. Wave tests are test methods that are quote unquote waived, essentially exempt from regulatory oversight if they meet certain requirements established by the statute. CLIA defines waived as tests cleared by the FDA for home use, so patients can basically purchase these products over the counter. Tests using such simple and accurate methodologies that the likelihood of erroneous results is negligible, and tests that pose no reasonable risk of harm to the patient if the test is performed incorrectly. In 1992, when the requirements for meeting CLIA were first published in the Federal Register, only simple and foolproof methods for eight analytes were waived. Beginning in 1997, however, Congress instituted revisions to the CLIA waiver provisions, and under the current process, waiver may be granted to any test listed in the regulation, any test system in which the manufacturer provides scientifically valid data to meet the waiver criteria, and test systems cleared by the FDA for home use. This change allowed for an increased number of tests to be categorized as waived. Examples of these tests include glucose testing use, using a glucometer, pregnancy tests, and urine dipsticks, which are many of the tests you, you might see being performed in physician offices. The other two levels of testing are moderate and high. These are also called non-waived. The criteria listed on this slide are considered key elements to performing a test correctly. When tests are determined to not meet the waived criteria, they are then assessed based on these items to determine if they are moderate or highly complex. To classify a test, each element is scored with a one, two, or three, one being the more basic and three being the most complex. Then based on the sum of the scores, they're classified as moderate, which is a score at 12 or less, or high, which is a score higher than 12. Of the test systems currently being marketed, more than one half are classified as moderate complexity, and the remaining, excluding those in the waves category, are high complexity. When the FDA determines test complexity, it is based on the manufacturer's instructions on how the test should be performed, from start or collection to finish the final result verification. Tests can only be defined by the complexity that they were given if these instructions are followed exactly. There are occasions where sites might deviate from manufacturer's instructions. When this happens, the complexity that was assigned by the FDA is null and void. When facilities develop its own test procedure or chooses to modify an existing FDA-approved procedure, which includes not following the manufacturer's directions, the test automatically falls into the high complexity category and is subject to CLIA's most stringent requirements. These are called laboratory developed tests or LDTs and modified tests respectively. So based on the complexity of testing that is being performed in a particular lab, you need to have a CLIA certificate that supports that level of testing. Once we determine the level of testing we are doing at a particular site, we apply for a CLIA certificate. Each certificate has a fee schedule, which is dependent on the number of test specialties, test complexity level, and test volume that is performed by the holder of the certificate. The lower the complexity, the lower the cost of the certificate. A certificate of waiver, or a COW, is what is obtained if a facility performs waived tests only. This is what a physician office typically holds. A provider performs microscopy registration, or PPM, is the certificate that is issued when a provider performs microscopy procedures only, so like fern testing. If a PPM certificate is held, waived tests may also be performed without obtaining an additional certificate. The last category of certificates are for labs that are performing moderate and highly complex tests. These labs initially apply for a certificate of registration. Once the laboratory is judged to be in compliance with the requirements through inspection, a permanent certificate of compliance is issued to those laboratories inspected by an agent of CMS or a certificate of accreditation is issued to laboratories seeking accreditation by a CMS deemed professional organization. The certificate of registration is issued as a temporary, if you will, until the formal inspection occurs. We'll talk a little bit more about the inspection process here soon. I mentioned earlier that the CLIA rule establishes the provisions by which we do testing in terms of quality and compliance. We won't spend a lot of time on wave testing simply because there's not much to comply with. The regulations are fairly simple, follow manufacturer's instructions. For non-wave testing, they are more complex. 
There are several sections of the regulations as they apply to non-wave testing. The next few slides will review some of those requirements for moderate and highly complex tests. The first component we will discuss is proficiency testing. Proficiency testing, or PT, is testing that is performed on blind samples that are purchased from an entity and handled just exactly like we would a patient sample. Results obtained are submitted to the PT provider and subsequent reporting comes back from them as to the accuracy of the submitted results in comparison with other facilities. PT providers are all approved by CMS and must follow certain guidelines set out in the CLIA rule in order to provide PT for facilities. In 2014, the CLIA PT regulation was updated to include specific direction on PT referral. This update came because there was fraud, for lack of a better term, with laboratories referring their PT to other labs. Truly, when you do this, this is not a reflection of the quality of your lab, and since this is such a key element of the quality program, steps had to be put in place in order to ensure that labs saw the negative impact this would have if you were caught doing this. The CLEAR regulation also mandates various quality requirements for non-wave testing. These requirements are organized into categories based on the normal path of a specimen through the laboratory. The path of a specimen through the laboratory is divided into three sections, pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical, and we're required to assess a variety of parameters ensuring that we hit each of these categories. As I mentioned earlier, following manufacturer's instructions is very important. Failure to follow manufacturer's instructions is one of the top deficiencies identified by inspectors for CLIA compliance. As a consequence, high quality standard operating procedures, or SOPs, are essential and required by CLIA. The CLIA rule lists out the components that all procedures for non-wave testing must at least include, things like patient preparation, specimen collection, labeling and preservation, just to name a few. CLIA states that method verification of performance specifications must be completed for all non-wave tests prior to implementation. Now, this is a mouthful. What this means is that each time a facility brings in new testing, they must perform steps to ensure that it is functioning as it is supposed to. This is to ensure that the environment, staff, equipment, and processes are functioning as they should and as the manufacturer intended. This is generally performed using known samples so that comparisons can be made. The specifications that are evaluated are accuracy, precision, reportable range, and identification of appropriate reference ranges. As a side note, this particular requirement is not only applicable when a facility brings in new testing, but is also required when you move locations. The reason this is necessary is that the environment in this example has changed. So you need to ensure that this did not have any impact on your test system or the patient results that are being generated. Quality control is one of the most important elements of laboratory testing. Quality control includes what regular activities must be performed for each test to ensure it is behaving correctly. This helps catch any issues before it becomes a patient safety issue. Manufacturer's instructions will always dictate what, at a minimum, we must perform in terms of quality control, because remember, that is what determines the test complexity. Many tests come with a requirement that you have to run a high and a low. This sort of QC is performed using reagent from the manufacturer of known value. Other quality control activities could include things like checking the temps of refrigerators and freezers each day, or assessing the speed of the centrifuge used during specimen collection. The CLIA rule, generally speaking, requires two levels of quality control to be performed each day of patient testing. Sometimes this was more than what was required by the manufacturer, however. Since we had to follow the CLIA rule, we had to keep up with the vigorous activity until, up until a few years ago when CMS decided to ease up on this rule if you could prove that this was not needed. Again, though, never doing less than the manufacturer required. So introduced in early 2015 and effective on January 1st, 2016, CMS changed the regulations in terms of quality control. This was the first time the rule was changed this significantly since it was updated in 1988. The new concept, IQCP, or Individualized Quality Control Program, was introduced. And that strategy gave labs the options to either follow CLEO regulations for quality control or develop an IQCP, 
neither of which though could still be could not be less than what the manufacturer's instructions state. So to further emphasize the importance of understanding the test complexity, there are different types of requirements for the personnel that are performing the testing as well as overseeing the testing. It makes sense with wave testing that there are really no specific personnel requirements as far as educational requirements are concerned. Staff that perform wave testing must be able to show that they have been trained and competencied annually, and this is the extent of it. Staff that perform moderate and high complexity testing are a little bit different, however. As can be imagined, because this is more complex than wave testing, there are higher educational requirements for those staff who perform this testing. There are several categories of personnel. Those, there are those that oversee the testing and those that actually do the testing. The top three titles, director, technical consultant, and clinical consultant, are the roles that oversee. And then, of course, the testing personnel are the ones that do. So to start, we'll talk about the director or the medical director. The director is responsible for all aspects of laboratory operation and administration. It is their name that is listed on the CLIA certificate as the responsible party for all testing that occurs under that CLIA certificate. Although the director may delegate the duties to qualified individuals, the director is ultimately responsible for ensuring that all duties are properly performed. The next role is the technical consultant. As a laboratory that performs moderate complexity testing, you must employ one or more individuals who are qualified by education and either training or experience to provide technical consultation for each of the specialties and subspecialties of services in which the laboratory performs moderate complexity test procedures. The second and third bullet points on this slide list out the educational requirements for a technical consultant. I will call out here that a technical consultant must have a bachelor's degree in science. I'll come back to this later because this is a goofy area of the rule, at least as it stands today. So remember that for moderate complexity testing, if you are designated as a technical consultant, which means you could do things like perform competency, you must have a BS in science. Clinical consultants must be assigned for moderate complexity testing. These are generally physicians based on educational requirements that are listed here. These folks serve as a liaison between the laboratory and clinicians. Many times their role includes explaining results and helping clinicians order the right test or understand what it is they are ordering. So the testing personnel minimum educational requirements for moderate complexity testing includes a high school education or equivalent, plus appropriate director approved training and continued competency assessment that, that is completed at least yearly. So moving on to high complexity testing and the roles and requirement, educational requirements for these staff, if you look at this list, there is some crossover. Um, you have the director, uh, clinical consultant, and then the testing personnel, the technical supervisor, and the general supervisor being new. As with moderate complexity testing, the medical director is responsible for the overall operation and administration of the laboratory. And if you notice in these educational requirements, the director for high complexity testing must have a doctorate or be an MD or a DO. This is a little different than what you saw for moderate. The technical supervisor is a role we have not yet seen. They establish the quality standards of the laboratory by selecting and monitoring methods and instrumentation and evaluating and documenting the competency of its personnel at least once per year after the first year of employment. The qualifications for this position range from a clinician to an individual possessing a bachelor's degree in medical technology or a clinical laboratory science or chemical, physical, or biological science, plus specified training and or experience. The clinical consultant role is the same between moderate and high complexity testing. The general supervisor role is another role that is not required for moderate complexity testing. And if you notice in the original slide that outlined all the roles for high complexity, you might have gleaned that technical consultant was not listed. The general supervisor role only applies to high complexity testing, and the technical consultant role only applies to moderate complexity. But they have very similar responsibilities, one of them being able to perform the competency on that personnel that do those tests. Now, here is where I will refer you back to what I told you to remember. When we talked about moderate complexity testing, the technical consultant had to have a BS in science. And if you look at this slide here, the requirement for the general supervisor is an associate's degree. This is the one backwards part of the rule because you would expect that based on everything else we have learned today that the higher complexity testing would have higher educational requirements when that is not the case. 
However, as a little bit of a spoiler alert, this is included in the proposed rule as an item that they are proposing to be changed. Finally, our testing personnel for high complexity testing. These folks must all have at least an associate's degree in science. So the next major topic we are going to talk about is inspections and accreditation. This is how all of the CLIA rules tie in with inspections that laboratories are required to have conducted. I mentioned earlier that for moderate and high complexity testing, once the laboratory is judged to be in compliance with the requirements through inspection, a permanent certificate of compliance is issued to those laboratories inspected by an agent of CMS, or a certificate of accreditation is issued to the laboratory seeking accreditation by a CMS deemed professional organization. And that this certificate of registration is temporary until that formal inspection occurs. So when you apply for a CLIA certificate, you're required to have an inspection to get your certificate of compliance or certificate of accreditation, and then you're required to be inspected every two years thereafter. There is a fee for this process. Inspections are generally unannounced, but must be conducted while the laboratory's CLIA certificate is still valid. CLIA allows for CMS to approve professional organizations to act on their behalf in the determination of compliance with CLIA standards. Inspections by these organizations give organizations a status of accreditation. Many testing sites decide to meet the CLIA requirements through professional accreditation. And accreditation is that process by which an agency or organization uses predetermined standards to evaluate and recognize a program of study in an institution. Testing sites voluntarily choose to be accredited by a CLIA deemed organization and pay the required fees, which are in addition to the ongoing CLIA fees. As of March 2021, approximately 260,000 testing sites received CLIA certificates, with 6.5% of these are accredited and inspected by DEEM organizations. Most accredited labs are inspected by COLA or CAP, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. Professional organizations that are approved to act on behalf of CMS in determining CLIA compliance are said to have DEEM status. These include Joint Commission, CAP, and COLA. These are the most common entities. Joint Commission is a DEEM status organization that a lab can choose to be inspected by. And as we, most people are aware, they also are responsible for inspecting entire hospitals and certain specialties within hospitals based on certain certification programs. Joint Commission re recognizes the test categories, including wave test methods, as defined by CLIA, but unlike CLIA, Joint Commission has specific requirements, including personnel training and quality control criteria, and inspects wave testing. Additionally, inspection is conducted by Joint Commission employees. The Laboratory Accreditation Program of the College of American Pathologists accredits only laboratory testing sites and not the entire healthcare organization. CAP spells out its requirements in a series of specialty-related checklists. All test sites must follow the lab general, all common, and team leader checklists, and then the specific checklist appropriate to the specialty of testing, for example, HEMO or COAG. Proficiency testing has been a, an important component of the CAP inspection philosophy. CAP accredited sites, including point-of-care sites, and those performing only wave testing must participate in, CAP, or in PT when available through CAP surveys or other CAP approved PT surveys for each analyte tested. CAP accredits over 8,000 laboratories and provides PT to 23,000 lab sites worldwide in more than 100 countries. For high complexity testing, CAP accredited test sites must identify a director, clinical consultant, technical supervisor, general supervisor, and testing personnel. These are all the roles we talked about a little bit earlier. CAP does prefer to see pathologists as the medical director, however, as long as the person in this role meets CLIA requirements, it is acceptable. The checklists that labs are inspected on include all types of items we discussed earlier. So now we're going to turn the presentation to the changes that came out of CMS most recently. The first change we're going to talk about is CMS 3355, which was published on July 11th of this year. This final rule is related to several key items, all of which are related to proficiency testing. The changes that were made to the PT requirements will be effective two years after the publication date of the final rule to allow laboratories and PT providers time to accommodate to the changes. This effective date is a July 11th, 2024. The changes is related to PT referral, which we will talk about shortly, 
has a much shorter effective date, that being 30 days after the publication date of the final rule, which is already in effect with that date being August 10th, 2022. Some of the high level changes in terms of microbiology specialties and subspecialties include the addition of broad categories for the types of PT required for each subspecialty and a more general list of organisms. Types of services used to be listed in the rule for each microbiology subspecialty and these have now been eliminated. And then there were some there were several reporting satisfactory performance criteria and verbiage changes made to the section of the rule that speaks to microbiology PT. Non-microbiology specialties and subspecialties also saw changes with 29 analytes added to the list of CMS-regulated analytes and five deleted. Additionally, there were updates made to the criteria for acceptable performance, including target values and acceptance limits. Some examples have been given on the slide showing, as with, my, as with the microbiology section, various reporting, satisfactory performance criteria, and verbiage changes have been made in the final rule. CMS made some changes to key terms that help frame the proficiency testing regulations. New definitions were published for acceptance limits and peer group. CMS also revised the definition of target values slightly to remove some obsolete references. The changes that we are seeing in this final rule are much needed in order to keep up with the testing and technologies that are in place today. Many aspects of the rule as related to PT don't make a lot of sense anymore with so many new tests being performed on a regular basis by labs and technologies being so much more accurate and precise as compared to what was available when the rule was last evaluated in 1992. As I mentioned earlier, the CLIA regulation determines who can, uh, who can be an approved PT provider. The newly revised rule includes a new provision that states that these programs are going for re that are going for reapproval must have at least 10 participants for each specialty, subspecialty, and analyte for which they are seeking reapproval. PT referral has always been a significant part of the CLIA regulation, this being because PT is such an important exercise to ensure that labs are producing quality results. PT referral in the past has always applied to moderate and high complexity testing. The finalized rule now includes wave testing in that expectation. This is the element of the rule that has been in effect as of August 10th. I've included a link on this slide to the Federal Register where you can review and read the rule in its entirety. While not fun reading necessarily, being familiar with the Federal regulations is a good habit to get into. Just shortly after the finalized rule changes came out, the Feds also issued a proposed rule. When a rule comes out, it is often in a proposed state with a comment period for folks in the industry like you and I to comment on the proposed language. All of the comments are gathered and then reflected upon, sometimes with changes being made as a result. It is our opportunity to let the rule writers know our opinions and thoughts on whether certain elements will work in the real world and what kind of impact they will have on operations. These proposed rule changes were published on July 26th with a comment period already having ended on August 25th. We are now waiting for the finalized changes that will be published, what is not expected to be released until after the first of the year because of the large volume of comments that were received. There were several main areas that the proposed rule focused on, fees, fiscal compatibility regulations, personnel requirements, and alternative sanctions for CMS to apply to certificate of waiver laboratories. So just like everything else nowadays, the fees that are currently enforced for CLIA certificates and activities are being proposed to increase. This not only includes fees for the actual certificate application process, which are being increased in several areas, but also in some of the activities surrounding the CLIA program, such as survey exercises. Fees are being proposed to increase for all existing fees, as well as assessments to be done every two years to determine the need for additional increases. Replacement and revised certificates will now have a fee associated with them if you are requesting a new certificate to be generated. Currently, there is no charge for this. Wave Labs are looking at a proposed charge of $25 in order to cover the expense the CLIA program must pay the FDA for the test complexity determinations they must complete. And then finally, surveys and desk reviews of unsuccessful PT will now have a charge associated with them if the proposed rule is finalized as is. The main reason for these increases is so that the CLIA program can continue to sustain itself 
and CMS has determined that if it does not increase their fees, it will not. This is a very busy slide, so I apologize. But the main area that the proposed rule addresses really is personnel. And this is one, this is one area of the CLEAR rule that has needed attention for quite some time as it has put much burden on laboratories. This is also one of the more contentious sections of the rule because it defines who can do what in regards to laboratory testing. With the proposed rule, there will be guidelines that will allow an assessment to be made of the personnel qualifications based on coursework that individuals with more traditional degrees have completed. These are degrees that don't necessarily say biology or chemistry, but have a heavy science focus. These individuals, if they meet the requirements of this new assessment, will now meet the requirements to hold certain clear roles within the laboratory. More clear and precise direction on when on-site visits should be performed was included. The proposed changes include clarifying certain definitions. Physical science is being proposed to be removed as a degree mainly because it's such a broad category. And then clarity has been included surrounding individuals who have a bachelor's in respiratory therapy, cardiovascular technology, and nursing. These have often been areas of contention in the past and continue to be with the new proposal. The proposed rule proposes to place nursing degrees on the same level as degrees in clinical laboratory science, biology, and chemistry. Currently, a medical director for high complexity labs must have a certain MD or board certified PhD. The proposed rule expands this definition to include professional doctorates and master's equivalency. The blood bank technical supervisor would no longer need to be an MD if the proposed rule is finalized. And finally, the proposed rule better aligns the requirements for the technical consultant and moderate level complexity, allowing someone with an associate's degree to fill the role of TC for moderate complexity testing, similar to the requirement for high complexity testing that currently allows an individual with an associate's degree to fill the general supervisor role. Many labs are excited about this part of the proposed rule because it really does make more sense. Specific to histocompatibility, there are some quality control regulations that are being proposed to be removed. These are items that are already covered elsewhere in the general quality control section of the rule. And finally, the proposed rule has included the ability for CMS to impose the same sanctions on certificate of waiver labs that they do for moderate and high complexity labs in the event of non-compliance. I've mentioned a few of the rationale components as I have discussed each proposed change, but included them all here. Generally speaking, the revisions that are coming out in this proposed rule are really long overdue, so we'll see how the final rule reads when it comes out in the next few months. Again, I've included a link on this slide to the Federal Register where you can review and read the rule if it's in its entirety, if you so choose, just a list of references. And here is my contact information. So with that, I'd like to conclude by, again, thanking everybody for being very patient. Um, and by saying that while the CLEAR regulation probably touches a broad area outside the purview of this group, making the assumption that many of you in the audience have an anatomic pathology background, it's important that you be aware of its existence and understand its relevance. All, lab all laboratorians play a key role within the laboratory, regardless of what department you work in. And it's important to understand what drives the overall department in many of the key decisions and processes that are put into place. I hope that you found this presentation worthwhile and valuable. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at my email address indicated on this slide.